Good morning and welcome to Southern Hills this morning. We do want to extend a special welcome to all of our guests and visitors, as well as those of you joining us via live stream. Um, I hope everyone's had a chance to pick up one of our bulletins this morning. If not, there's still plenty of copies left back in the back foyer. And if you are visiting with us today and haven't had a chance to stop by our visitor center, we encourage you to uh, stop by there sometime this morning. Uh, more information about Southern Hills and the things that we're involved in uh, but just a few announcements we'd like to make before we begin. I uh, do want to continue to remember Mona Duty. Um, she has been moved to a live hospice. I um, also want to remember Jim and, and their family as they are, they are working through that situation. also want to remember Sharon Welburn. Um, she's going through chemo treatments. Also, Doug Smithson has been moved to NHC Place in Columbia. Uh, Bobby Will Hoyt was in the hospital, but is now back at home at Morning Point. Also want to continue to remember Tanya McGrady. She is at home recovering from uh, some recent surgery. Uh, tonight is Youth Night. We're looking forward to uh, having our young men participate. Tonight's speakers will be Caleb McGrady and Reagan Graham. So looking forward to both of those young men speaking to us. Um, tomorrow morning at uh, 10 a.m., Disaster Relief will be packing boxes on their typical box food box line. Uh, the address is in the bulletin if you're able to go and help them pack boxes. Uh, tonight at Brentwood Skate Center, we'll be having our Back to School Bash right after our Sunday evening services. This is open to the entire congregation, uh, so it, more information is in the bulletin, or if you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, ask me about that. Also, that, that is all the uh, announcements that I have for this morning. If you would, bow with me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We're thankful for this time as we gather around your throne. Father, we pray that you be with each one of us as we enter into this period of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all sing. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns.
us give me more strivings with him, more patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of his care, more joy in his service, more purpose in prayer, more gratitude give me, more trust in the Lord, more pride in his glory, more hope in his word, more tears for his sorrows, more pain at his grief, more meekness and trial, more praise for relief, more purity give me, more strength to The reading this morning is coming from Philemon, uh, starting in verse 8 through the end of the chapter. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. I am sending him back. You therefore receive him, that is, my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but voluntary. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If, you then, if, if then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord. Having confidence in your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. You may have noticed before the service, we had slides up there telling everyone, all the members that are involved in teaching. And we want to direct your attention after service to the bulletin boards in the back that, that show all of our members that are involved in teaching at Sunshine School and in public school and in private school, and in homeschool. I think you'd be surprised at how many people are involved in teaching our children. The elders want to 
to spotlight that and let you know about all those people because we're, we're proud of them and we pray for them. We want you to, to let the, give them a pat on the back at what they do. Uh, it's, it's a very noble thing that, that the people that teach our children and the elders want to honor that. So take a minute to, to, to pay attention to all the people at Southern Hills that teach. There, there's, there's a lot more probably than you think. Uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this service and the ability which we have on the first day of the week to come together and worship you and sing praises and pray and look at your word and, and, and hear a lesson and observe the Lord's Supper. Father, we thank you for all those things. We thank you for the fact that we can come together as like-minded people and support each other and lift each other up. Father, we pray for our teachers and that noble profession that, that strives to impart wisdom to our children. We pray for each teacher, whether they're at Sunshine School or Homeschool or in the public or private schools. We know, Father, their job is difficult and challenging. Father, we know it's rewarding when, when they have success in teaching our children. Father, we thank you for them. We pray for your blessings upon them. Father, we ask you to be with them, and we, we ask you to help us remember what a good job they do. We pray for their families, as that job can be challenging at times. We pray that you'll lift their families up and, and bless them. Father, as we, when we open the service, we pray to, you know, to you to bring some names that are of concern to us. We pray for the Duty family with Miss, <clears throat> Miss Mona. We pray that your hand would be in that situation as they help move through that. We love them and we pray for them. We, we wish you'd be with them. Father, we pray for Sharon Welburn as she continues with her treatments. We pray that, that, that she will continue to progress and, and that will go according to your will. That she'll be healed. Father, we pray for Doug Smithson and Bobby Wilhoyt as they work through their, their times in life. We know, Father, that they've had some challenges and we pray for them. Father, we ask you to be with Tom McGrady after her surgery. We know, Father, she's had you know, a time getting that scheduled, and we're, we're grateful that she did, and we, we pray that it's gone well. Father, we know there are others here at Southern Hills that, are, that have medical problems or ailments that we haven't mentioned or that maybe aren't aware of everyone, and we pray for all those people that they're that their bodies would be healed according to your will. Father, we pray tonight for our youth service. We pray for Caleb and Reagan, that they will have a ready recollection of what they prepared to say, and our hearts will be tender and willing to hear their message. Father, we ask you to be with us during this service, that everything we do is according to your will. Uh, we pray for Garrett. Uh, like we did for Caleb and Reagan, that he, he will have a good recollection and we will be ready to hear the message he's come to tell us. Father, we are weak and sinful. Often we happily choose the things we would do and, and ignore the things you would have us to do. Father, we ask your forgiveness for those sins. We ask you to put us back on the straight and narrow path. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll partake in the Lord's Supper following this song.
This is now the time where we come together once a week to remember the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Out of the acts of worship that we do, there are only two that are specified to be done on the first day of the week, and that is first the Lord's Supper, and then the collection of the saints, giving what we have and giving it to the further furtherance of the kingdom. Since we only partake of the Lord's Supper one week, it is only important and only natural that we should put more emphasis on it and put more focus towards it. Because any other act of worship we can do at any other time. But the Lord's Supper is specifically meant to be done and only can be properly done once every week and on the first day of the week. So let us clear our minds of any earthly thoughts and of anything that is keeping us from remembering our Lord and Savior. If you will, turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2 so we can help prepare our minds. Ephesians chapter 2. We'll start in verse 1 and go to verse 10. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom all we once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved." And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We ourselves could not justify our sins. We ourselves could not atone for our sins. It is by grace we are saved through faith. It is by God's son Jesus and the sacrifice that he paid for us that we can be saved. He goes on to say, 
in verse 14 that we are alien, actually in verse 12, that we are alienated from God. But through Christ, we are brought back together. So let's go to our God and Father in prayers. We thank for the bread, the body of Christ that paid the ultimate price for us. Almost gracious, glorious, great God and Father in heaven, we come to you now so thankful for your son and the sacrifice that he paid for us. Father, without his sacrifice, we have no hope for eternal salvation. But thankfully, through his blood, we can be saved and we can be in Christ and we can be part of his church and be in a saved state. Father, we're so thankful for the body of Christ that was bruised and was beaten for our afflictions. By his stripes, we are healed. Please help us to clear our minds and focus on your son at this time. And it's through him that we pray, amen. It is now at this time we'll remember the blood of Christ. In verse 12 of Ephesians chapter 2, he says, Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. By his blood we are healed and those of us who have been baptized into Christ have been cleansed in his blood and have been put in Christ and therefore are in a saved state as if we remain faithful to him. Let us remember his blood and what it has done for us. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Oh, most wonderful Heavenly Father, we come to you now so thankful for the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ that cleanses us from every spot and stain. We realize that he was the perfect sacrifice there's no way we could be saved without his cleansing blood. And Father, for that we are so thankful. We know that you loved your son. We are so thankful that you loved us and sent him for us. Please, please help us to never forget that. But at this moment now, help us to remember it and honor his sacrifice of blood. And it's through him we pray. Amen.
We have now concluded the Lord's Supper, and now we go to the second act of worship that is specified to be done on the first day of every week. And this has been deemed an appropriate time by our elders to give. In, in first, uh, first Corinthians chapter 16, starting in verse 1, it reads, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Here the Apostle Paul is telling us to give something to the furtherance of the kingdom. So there'd be no collecting. Now, there are many different ways to give in life. We can give of our time. We can give of our service. But here we are directly um, told to give how we prospered by our money. Now, God doesn't need our money, but he wants us to give in a cheerful heart. He wants us to be a giving people. So please give in a cheerful way to the furtherance of the kingdom. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Most gracious God and glorious Father in heaven, we can be now so thankful for the blessings that you shower upon us. Father, here especially in Williamson County, we are exceptionally blessed to be a people where jobs run abundantly. Father, please thank you for giving us a place where we can live in a way that is comforting, in a way that is nice and leisurely. Father, please help us to never take that for granted. But Father, please most importantly, do not let what we have block our love for you and help us not to be a stumbling block for us. Help us to understand that everything we have on this earth is only because you have let us have it and that it will all perish one day. Father, please keep our hearts tender and in a giving way. Please help us to give of our time and of our service. But Father, right now, please help us to have the hearts to give out of from what we have prospered. Father, please help us to never take you for granted. And thank you for all the blessings you shower upon us. And it's through Christ we pray. Amen. Before we have our lesson, if you would please be standing for this song.
you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open them up to the 15th Psalm. Um, Psalm 15. And as you're turning there, I want you to think about the presence of God. And that is like the idea of being with God. Being in his presence. It's actually a pretty important theme throughout the Bible of what it takes to be able to live with God. As a matter of fact, you'll, you'll find that every human being has one of two outcomes. You will be with God or you will not be. I think the, the most terrifying existence that could ever be explained is, is an existence without God. Paul, as he wrote to the church of the Thessalonians, was describing these people who just completely and totally rejected the Christ. And, and their rejection of the Christ actually caused them to persecute Christians, to hurt them, to hate them and despise them, to cause division and disruption within them. And so Paul wrote to those Christians and he wanted to comfort them. And he said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, to give you who are troubled rest. When the Lord Jesus reveals himself from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them, who know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction, hear it, from the presence of of the Lord and from the glory of his power. They'll be punished being thrown away from God's presence. And I've said this before here. I want you to understand this. This world has never known a darkness, a complete depravity of not having at least some semblance of God's presence. Terrifying. On the other hand, that's certainly not the outcome of everybody. Not everybody rejects God. Not everybody says, God, I don't want to be with you. I mean, at the end of the day, those who don't want to be with God will be thrown away from his presence and they will have to deal with that outcome. But some people want to be with God. And to them, John describes this ending that is, that is fascinating. I, I wish I could see what John saw in Revelation uh, 21, where he describes this new heaven and new earth descending out of heaven. Um, and the, the voice that he heard calling from heaven. In Revelation 21 and verse three, he says, he heard a loud voice calling from heaven, saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them. And they will be his people. And he himself will be their God. He will dwell with them. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. There shall be no more sorrow. There shall be no more crying. For the former things have passed away. He will dwell with them. And it's like when you're living with God, all things are right. And so the question is like, there's the two outcomes, right? And there's obviously one that's more desirable, obviously one that, that we want. And yet there's also this really interesting like aspect of it that there's a sense in which like right now, and, and, and the people that we are, we are described as either being with God or, or not with him. 
Maybe not in the ultimate sense of it. I mean, those who are without God now aren't the same as they will be when they're eternally without God. And, and those who are with God right now aren't the same as those who will like live with him like in, in, in that more literal type of sense and one day in, in, in the future. Like, but there's a sense in which all people right now are making and taking their sides. You're with God or you're not with him. You're in his presence or you're not. And the question is, like, how can I live now and how can I live always in the presence of God? And I think that answer is given to us in Psalm 15. Okay, so the way Psalm 15 works, it's, it's broken kind of into three parts. It begins with a question. Then you have an answer to the question. And then it concludes with like this promise that is given. So what's the question? Psalm 15 and verse one says, Lord, O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Uh, who shall dwell on your holy hill? Now, you'll notice like it's very heavily like Old Testament type of language. Because right, in the Old Testament, you had this, this place that was described as like where God lived. It, it, when, when Israel began, like, like God brought them out of Egypt and, and he was leading them and they were wandering throughout this wilderness and he was bringing to this promised land. Like they had this place called the tabernacle. It was essentially a tent. Right, And it was this place that was meant to be put up and taken down and put up and taken down. And they were to make camp and they were to set this place up. And this place was going to have all these different areas, a courtyard, a holy place, a holy of holy place. And like the idea is like, this is where Israel goes to worship God. Some, not everybody, could go into the holy of holies. And like, like it, was, it was this place where like God, like you had this Ark of the Covenant and like it was the idea like God is here. And it's like this temporary residence of God, but it's gonna be folded up and it's gonna be taken to the next camp and, and then it's going to be put up again. And like the idea is that like you, you are sojourning, right? You're just wandering from place to place. And, and when you get to a place, you put up this tent and, and you have God's presence. And then, and then you fold the tent down, you sojourn and you wander and then you set up this tent. And, and like, it's, it's this like kind of like non-temporary in a sense, presence of God. And then what happened is that Israel finally had their land. And then they had these kings. And you remember that King David had this idea that, that, that God should have a more permanent structure. And, and God didn't allow David to build it because David was too much of a warrior and he had shed too much blood. And so Solomon, his son, actually constructed, and we read about that, like this beautiful beautiful temple. And the idea is like, it's, it's more of a permanent structure. It's not to be taken down and, and, and taken to another camp. Like it dwelt on what we know, the holy hill. Why was it holy? Because God was there. It was the hill where God lived. Kind of their idea of it. It's where God's presence was. And so like it's two questions, but it's really one. It's kind of like saying, God, who can come to your presence? God, who can live there? God, who can come into your presence? And God, who can always be with you? Who will you allow to live with you? Not temporarily, but forever. Like to where I can be with God now and I will always be with him. And he answers the question and there's a lot of things that are said here. I think you'll find that like, like there's different categories that are given, five of them. The first answer is this, he who walks blamelessly and does what is right 
and speaks truth in his heart. So like it's this category that really kind of like, it represents in a sense like the whole being of a person. He's a blameless person. Not perfect. Uh, some of your translations say upright or something along the lines. It, it has this idea of like, in every area of his life, he's trying to live right. There's no area that he just gives himself over. You know, that like maybe he worships in, in the way God would say, and he listens to God here, and he listens to God here. But in this one area of his life, he does it. Now, a blameless person is someone who inspects every area of their life, and they try within all the areas of their life to, to be upright, to, to do good, to, to live the way God would have them live. He says he does what is right. He does good things. It's not just about like avoiding bad things. That's part of it. But, but he looks to see how he could do good. And he looks to see how he can help. And he looks to those who are in need. And, and as you read throughout the law of the Old Testament, as you read into the New Testament, you'll find that God is extremely concerned with how we treat people who are oppressed and, and people who are in need and people who are poor and, and people who don't have and like, these people who will live in the presence of God are people who do what is right. Um, and they speak truth in their heart. It's kind of an interesting way of saying it. It's like, he's not talking about your lips necessarily. He's talking about truth being like in your heart. Like you'll notice, like he's talking about the way a person walks and what a person does and what's in that person's heart because what you'll find is those things go like together and you can't separate them. Why does he do good? It's because his heart is good. Why is he upright or why is he blameless? It's because of his heart. God's not concerned with like just going through actions. Like he wants us to be good and pure in heart. And when our hearts are right and when our hearts hold on to truth and our hearts want what is good and right, like let that overflow into your actions. Let that be what motivates you in the way that you live. It's the purity of heart, the truth of heart that you hold within you that flows out. And that's why you act the way you act. And God says, those people will live with me. Those people can be in my presence. He deals with how we like interact with others who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor and takes up or, or nor takes up a reproach against the, his friend. So like, he's not someone like, like, like those who live with God, you're not going to find them like speaking evil things about other people. A lot of times, like, you'll, you'll find that people seem to think that this word, like, has to do with, like, like a person that like, carefully scrutinizes other people so that they can speak evil against people. Like, the reality is this, guys. Like, if we're just, like, being honest, every single one of us has things that are not good. Like, you can look at my life, and you can find some things to slander. I know it. Like you could look at my life and if you look close enough, you're going to find some things or you could say, well, Garrett does this bad. And you know what? You're right. You say, well, Garrett doesn't do this good. And you know what? You're right. The reality is that every one of us has things about us that are not good, that are not right. Areas where we could be better, areas where we should be stronger, areas where we're weak. And so it's not like, I think sometimes people feel like if they're accurate in their statements, if they're telling the truth, they can talk bad about people. But then you could talk, like you just justify where you could talk bad about anybody because like everybody has that. The idea is no, you don't do it. You don't slander. If you want to live within the presence of God, now and always, you won't slander. 
with your tongue. You won't do, e- do evil to your neighbor. Like you'll think about what is good for them, what will help them, what will hurt them. Like you're, we already said like he does the good. Well, he doesn't do the things that are going to hurt people. Physically, emotionally, spiritually. Like, how do you interact with me? Like, when, when, when you interact with people, either through speech or through action, like, are they the better off because of it? Um, he doesn't take up a reproach against his friend. So this is kind of interesting because it's more passive, right? Like, like not only does he not speak and slander, but when other people are doing the slandering, like he's not gonna, he's not gonna take it. He's not gonna be like, no, you're right. He doesn't take up a reproach. He goes on and talks about the way we view people in whose eyes a vile person is despised, who honors those who fear the Lord. You know, I, I think it's good that we teach our children to be careful who they hang around, to teach our kids about um, peer pressure, about influences. I remember when I was a kid, like I would hear passages like, like 1 Corinthians 15, 33 quoted a lot. Evil companions corrupt good morals. It's good that we teach kids that. I think it's unfortunate that at some point in a person's life, we kind of stop teaching that. It's like they graduate high school or they graduate college. And so all of a sudden, like that's no longer the speech, right? That's, that's no longer what we talk about. Like I'll be honest, like, like when I was a kid growing up and like I would have like youth lessons or something, like I heard 1 Corinthians 15, 33 taught a lot. Like as an adult, I don't know how often I've heard that taught to me. But there never comes a point in your life where you don't have to be concerned with who you are around. There's a reason the Bible tells us, not just children, but all people, the sexually immoral, don't like withdraw them from your fellowship. Divisive people don't have anything to do with them. Note them and stay away from them. It's because the people we hang around when you're young and when you're old, at all stages in your life, when you hang around people, you become somewhat like them. I have friends that I spend a lot of time with and guess what? We're similar in a lot of ways. Not every way, but a lot of ways. It's just natural to be around people and to start to act like them. It's funny even, like, like watching people and like hearing things and, and, and not like always bad. Things. Like it, it's good too sometimes. Like where like you, you, you'll, you'll listen to you know, your kids talking or, or you're listening. I, I've even seen it with myself and I've seen it with my wife. Like, well, they'll say something. I'm like, I've never heard you say that before. But this person you're hanging around says it a lot, right? And like what happens is like you start saying kind of the things that they say. And, and we all do that, right? I, I was just talking to Alicia the other day that I'm, uh, there's this podcast I listen to, and um, it's, it's a Bible podcast. And, and the guy always says, yeah, let's meditate on that. And uh, the other day I was teaching class, and I said, let's meditate on this for a second. And I thought to myself, like, where did that come from? Like, I never say that. Like, but, like, it came from because I heard those people saying it all the time. And, like, it just, like, like, came out of my mouth, right? Like, what happens is we hang around people is that we start to be somewhat like them. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes that's bad. And like a wise person will be able to spot it. There are people who are not good to be around, who are vile. They're, they're immoral. Uh, they're divisive. They're, they're the slanderers and the people who do evil. Like the, the things we've described before, Notice it. Despise it. I'm not going to be like that. Avoid it. But there are those who fear the Lord. 
those who, who, who are like the good, right? Those who are blameless and, and those who are right and those who speak truth in their hearts. They're, they're, they're not the people who, who slander with their tongue and they're not the people who do evil to their neighbors. They're not the people who take up reproaches against friendly. Like notice it and actually honor those people. Um, he goes on. He says, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. Like, so we all make promises to people. Interesting how he phrases this. It's like, okay, when you make a promise to somebody, what's it going to take for you to not keep that promise? Because the people who live within the presence of God who swear to their own hurt. Like, it's not like I'm going to do this unless it inconveniences me and then I won't do it anymore. When I tell you I'm going to do it, like, I will go through great pain to make sure I keep my, my word. They swear to their own hurt and they don't change. I said I will do it. If, if it means it's going to hurt to keep my word, then that's what I will do. And then finally, deals with how we like interact with money. Um, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. Okay, so again, like the idea here is, is again, I mentioned it earlier that the Bible says a great deal about how we do good Help those who are in need. Help the poor. Help the mistreated. And so like the passage I don't think is dealing with somebody who is like a businessman. He's making a deal. You know, he owns a bank. And so he says, yeah, I'll be here, but there's a certain amount of interest or whatever. Like the idea is that like when somebody's in need and you say, well, I can help you. This person's hungry. This person does, you know, the, the person's going to lose their home or whatever it is. Like, and this person's in need. And you're like, you know what? Let me help you with that. Here's some money. And, and, and when you pay me back, 10% interest. Like, you're like, no, like, don't give like that. This, 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 your giving is really not about giving and helping. It's really just about what, what you do. You're acting like a businessman when you help somebody who's in need. Don't, don't give, don't help and be benevolent in the idea that like you're going to receive something from it. I think our, our Wednesday night speaker this past week uh, brought up the passage where Jesus said, like when you invite people to a banquet, don't, don't invite the people who can pay you back. Like it's, it's this idea that like sometimes like we're real like benevolent if we think we'll get something out of it. He says, don't be that way. Be benevolent. Give. And don't expect to gain in return. Who does not take up a bribe against the innocent? Again, there are people who are mistreated. Don't help mistreat people. I guess... Help the mistreated. Don't help the people who are trying to mistreat. Don't aid in the mistreatment of others. Right? So the question is, who can, who can, in a sense, live with God now and always? Who can, who could sojourn? In the tent? And, and who could abide on the holy hill? Like, like who... Who can be with God now and who will be with God always? The answer is what we've just read, right? It deals with, with being blameless and upright. It, it deals with um, the, the, the speaking truth in the heart. It, it deals with how we interact with people and whether we're slanderers and whether we take up a reproach and whether we do evil. Like, like all the things we've talked about, that's the answer. And so what you'll find is like, he's, he's just answered the question to those who can be with the Lord those who can dwell with him, those who can be in his presence. And he ends with this promise. 
He who does these things shall never be moved. You want to live in the presence of God. You want to never be moved from the presence of God. Be the type of person he just described. Those are the people who can go into his presence. Those are the people who will stay in his presence. Those are the people who will never be moved from his presence. Everybody, you, me, everybody, has one of two outcomes. You will live with God or you will not. The person you are now determines whether you will be with God now and whether you will be with him always. Uh, my prayer for you, my, 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 certainly my prayer for myself, uh, is that we will be the type of people who could always live with God. Who in that new Jerusalem, right? The holy city ascends from heaven and, and the loud voice is the tabernacle of God is with men. And, and he will dwell with them. That, that they will be his people and he will be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain for the former things that passed away. My prayer is that we will be the people who will be his people. He will be our God. He will live with us. He will wipe our tears away. Keep us from sorrow. Keep us from death. Let's make sure that we are living in the way he says, you need to live if you want that to happen. If there's anyone in here this morning who is not yet a Christian, we would love to help you become one. If we can study with you, we would certainly love to study with you. If we can pray for you, we would love to pray for you. If there's anyone this morning who needs to be baptized, we would love to baptize you. If there's something we can do to help you in your walk with God, we want to give you this opportunity to sit on one of the front rows while we stand and sing this invitation song. Bring Christ your broken life so thankful that each one has made a decision to worship with us this morning. We'll be meeting again this evening at 5 p.m. After this closing song and prayer, we have Bible classes. We'd love for everyone to stay and be with us. We'll sing one final song, verses 1 and 3.
Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we humbly bow before thee this morning. We thank thee that you've afforded us the time to come together as Christians and study from your word and hear and participate in songs of praise and hymns and offer prayers unto thee. We're very grateful that we live in a country that's uh, in a way that we can do this without fear from our government that, that blocks us, that we can come here in safety. We pray for the men and women who are missionaries throughout the world today that will be carrying your, world, your word to people and do so in fear of their lives. We, we ask thy blessings upon them and, uh, and bless their efforts that they may be fruitful. We do want to remember uh, the duties in our prayer this morning. Uh, we ask thee to be with them and continue to be with Sharon Welburn and Tanya McCrady and Mr. Smithson. In a few moments, we're going to depart to classes. We pray that you would be with the teachers and those people that will be bringing your word to us. We are very grateful for all that you do for us here at this congregation. Uh, we pray that everything we do is done in, a, in accordance with your will. We pray and thank you for your son. We thank you for the sacrifice that you allowed him to offer on our part. And we offer this prayer through his name. Amen. <laughs> 